Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Giants Weekly, where we learn from giants in the tech and startup universe together every Tuesday. My name is Tip. I'm part of the Blackbird team. And this morning, we will be learning from the CEO of Startmate, Michael Batko. Michael is now running his fifth cohort of the Startmate Accelerator. He's coached hundreds of founders throughout his time and has seen the best and worst pitches to investors. Before Startmate, Michael ran operations at Marketplace Startup Expert 360, where he helped raise a Series B from Airtree Ventures. Any question for Michael, throw them into the Q&A and we'll try and answer every single one of them in a rapid fire Q&A session. But first, over to you, Michael, for the presentations on pitches, do's and don'ts. Awesome, well, thanks so much, Tip. All right, we've got a lot to cover. <laughs> so we're getting started right on time and straight into it. So um, happy Tuesday morning, 8 a.m., get ready. Um, I'm just gonna quickly share my screen and you should be able to see me on the side as well. Um, and this is one of those presentations where you can actually take your laptop about, take your pitch deck if you have one and make changes throughout it. Usually this is a 138 slide presentation and it takes two hours, um, but we only have 30 minutes. So I distilled it down to 82 slides. And um, so we still have a lot of slides to go through. So I'll be talking really, really fast, but please put the questions in the Q&A um, and I can answer them afterwards as well. Um, the whole goal for the session is to give, for me to give you an actionable framework for a better pitch deck and with really actionable examples. And the whole result should be that you had a 200% conversion on your coffee meetings. So if you get free conversations, you should be able to then to increase it by 200% after the next 30 minutes. So hopefully you get a lot out of it. I'm going to actually start with a disclaimer just because you can see so many opinions online and there's so many different um, and so much advice out there and so much conflicting advice as well. And um, lots of people will disagree with me on this one. And this is just what I've seen. And so 100% just take what's relevant to you and discard all the rest. All right. I'm actually going to start with a little bit of fundraising before we go into the pitch deck itself, just to explain where in the journey um, I'm actually even talking about. And just to even set expectations, um, pitching partners in a VC fund see about a thousand pitch decks every single year. And so that's a lot of pitch decks. The crazy thing about partners in a VC though is that each partner makes roughly one, two or three investments per year, right? So you, and that's just to set your expectations on how, um, how polished that pitch deck has to be. You want to be one out of those thousand pitch decks they see. To be fair, partners see um, actually after seeing a pitch deck, they still meet more than one or two founders, but you actually want to be aiming to be like the top one, two or three spots, which they see this entire year. And this is the reason why we're talking about all, those, all of those pitch decks. The journey of, um, of raising money is a six month full-time job and lots of founders don't believe me. We've seen it so often in Startmate and hindsight founders always tell us, oh my God, it was very, very, a very long journey. It was super time intensive and, and you see once you get there, but I always recommend only one founder to see or usually to go through the fundraising journey. All of those pretty colors in here, um, those are the different stages. So just to walk you through how it usually works is um, you've got roughly a month of preparation, which is getting the pitch deck ready and getting a target list of, of investors who you're going to be talking to. And um, so you're already in the perfect place in the next 30 minutes, you're basically taking this one month and shortening it to possibly a week, um, which is going to be super useful. The second stage is after um, sending out all your pitch decks, you ideally have 40 to 100 investor meetings. So those are coffee conversations. They usually um, go from one co coffee conversation to the next one. You build up relationships. Ideally, you build up those relationships over months and years. Um, often uh, people start fundraising a bit too late as well. And um, this is basically relationship building. And after one of those coffee chats, if a VC fund um, um, likes to progress you to the next stage, it's, it's what we call a partner meeting. At the partner meeting, um, you've got roughly, well, you've got usually all the partners sitting on the table giving, um, and you pitch for 45 minutes to 60 minutes and they ask you lots of questions. It's a very casual conversation, um, but it's kind of like the, one of the final stages of the fundraising process after which it's only really a term sheet, which you receive from a VC, the final documents, which is a due diligence and why are the money? And then the money actually sits in your bank account. So this is a six month journey um, and it can take a very long time. The reason why I'm telling you all of this is because number one, building your company is actually the 
most important thing. It's an, a really long journey and this is actually what you should be focused on. Um, fundraising is kind of the, the step in between. If you, if you want to raise from venture capital, if it is the right fit for you, it's not the right fit for everybody. Um, but you, if you, once you are, have raised from venture capital, usually then companies kind of raise every one and a half years, one and a half to two years, roughly. But yeah, building the company is actually the important part and fundraising is really just there to fuel the tank to make you go just as fast as a rocket ship. It's for companies which grow insanely fast. But yeah, the reason why I'm really telling you all this is because of pitch decks. Um, so there are two types of pitch decks. So as you just saw the journey, there's um, the marketing deck and there's the board deck. And the board deck itself is kind of like a 30 to 40 slide deck with lots of appendix. You present it in front of the partners, as I just mentioned, at a later stage of the process. And, um, and partners are, just ask you lots of questions. What we're talking about today is the marketing deck. The marketing deck is what helps you get from the preparation stage to those 50, 40 to 100 investor meetings. And um, I just want to set expectations. This is, this is the deck itself we're talking about. We're not talking about the, the partner kind of board deck later the whole idea of the pitch deck is to help you meet the people who will fund you and um, that's the goal of it and wow i did cut the slides down so i'm going straight into it now again so with the marketing deck super high level what does it look like it's eight to ten slides very short and most of you are going to hate me for saying that because most of you probably have 30 or 40 slides already so you're just going to have to cut that down the other thing is um, usually pitch decks are reviewed in 20 seconds or less. So it's similar to when you're recruiting and you look at lots and lots of CVs um, people skim through that and make a decision pretty fast. If it's worth meeting for 30 minutes, it's only a 30 minute meeting afterwards and the decision can be made very quickly. So you want to capture people's imagination within 20 seconds or less. The other thing is you always send it via email. So um, if you send it via email, always, always send it as a PDF, never send it as a keynote or um, PowerPoint because it always distorts the formats. It doesn't look as nice. And when you send it by email as a PDF, everybody always scans it in preview mode. People don't ever download your pitch deck and put it on their desktop or in a folder. It's always, um, or sorry, when I say always again, like this is just from my own experience, but like people just click on it in an email and just scroll through it. So um, that's, see what it looks like. So this is um, an example of Propeller. Propeller's pitch deck, you can see on the side there um, an inbox and it just like straight from the inbox, there's like a little attachment um, and you just click on the attachment, it just opens up like that and you just scroll through the deck. And this is also the reason why it should be as a PDF. Um, right, the basics. So include your email address and phone number prominently on the first slide. So actually um, the examples which I'm showing you sometimes are good and bad. In Propeller's example, there is no um, one liner, there's actually no phone and no email address, so that's bad. Um, but yeah, just fix it up. And um, when people review your deck, they just basically, if they look at it the second or a third time, they usually wanna contact you. So just have that on the very first slide. Don't do legal disclaimers, you'll see that um, you don't actually have much much space on those pitch decks, so legal disclaimers actually don't really mean much. Don't ask people for um, NDAs, especially in that early stage. Um, as we said, partners see a thousand pitch decks. They just can't actually sign an NDA um, because they'll be just, imagine signing an NDA once a week, you'd have 50 NDAs, NDAs signed by the end of the year. And in the second year, you wouldn't be able to know who you're even allowed to talk to anymore. So nobody will even look at your pitch deck if in the very first stage you even ask for um, signing an NDA. This is maybe a counterintuitive one to what we're taught in university, but um, make the headers tell the story. So rather than um, having like the team, the problem, the solution up there in the header, and then all the description at the bottom, actually make the header itself be the summary of what we should be able to take away from the slide. So in an ideal world, you literally have the entire story of the pitch deck just through the headers themselves. And just a couple of examples here. So I'm just gonna quickly skim through some, um, some slides and you'll see what you notice visually on the slides and what you take away as you quickly skim through it. We issue electronic shares, options, debt and derivatives. We automate the approval and compliance. We track the cap table, we track the portfolio. So when you read through slides like that, 
the first thing you always notice is a header. You don't even look at the picture. You don't even look at the bottom text. And you can really quickly get the idea of what's actually going on in the slides without having to go in through all the detail. So those are not the perfect slides, but again, like you see where your eye leads you. And this is, this is kind of like the story you're following. Get it designed. Readers are grateful when something is nicely designed. And um, that doesn't mean you have to pay somebody if you're great at designing, if you're good at um, just making it um, beautiful, totally do that as well, but actually spend the time and make it beautiful. Um, because readers are grateful when something is nicely designed, which means if they're grateful, they're also more likely to read it. If they're more likely to read it, they're also more likely to meet you. And if they're more likely to meet you, they're also more likely to fund you. Because what we actually care about is getting that meeting, right? This pitch deck is literally just there to get you the meeting. You use numbers, not adjectives. So um, this is one where you can literally skim through your entire deck and search for every single adjective you use because we have very fast growth or very high um, use, uh, user numbers just doesn't really mean anything. Always, always substitute numbers um, with adjectives, even if they're small numbers, like they're still way more useful and just actually help you um, help the reader calibrate what stage you're at as well. Infographics should simplify, not confuse. Infographics should always um, make things really easy to understand. Usually, um, infographics, as we mentioned, you only have 20 seconds on the slide. They often get a little bit confusing. Um, so just really simplify it. Pictures, great. I would actually take infographics completely out. Check your spelling, absolute basic. Um, always, always do that. Do that. Um, it is, yeah. If you don't put enough um, time and effort into your pitch deck, then the reader can wonder what else are you not putting enough time into in your business itself. This is another one which you're going to hate me for, which is no more than 20 words per slide. Ideally, what you want to do is um, just really simplify, concisely have one message on each slide, have no more than like three key takeaways on every single slide. And ideally, they're summarized in like pictures and 20 words per slide. People are skimming it. You don't want to explain your entire business model. And this is probably the most crucial part. You don't want to explain your entire business business on 10 slides because you physically can't. But what you want to do is raise enough interest for people to give you 30 minutes of the time after reading this pitch deck. That's what you want to do. And so you want to raise enough interest for people to meet you. And now the first slide. So. We're 12 minutes in, great. So I'll just spend another 10 minutes on this and I'll walk you through each slide and um, just give you a very high level and then we can dive into some questions. What does nailing a first slide mean? Super simple um, and just keep it very simple is logo, contact details and one liner. So that's um, your company logo, as you can see here, um, you've got um, email address, telephone number and your one-liner, this really easy, understandable thing um, which people can take away. Usually at this stage, I do a workshop in the, um, in the pitch deck coaching I usually do, which is um, you, the test you want to do is you can walk up to some random person on the street, tell them your one-liner, and they can tell you what you do and whose problem you're solving afterwards. That's what you want to aim for. And um, often we do this exercise and, um, between all the founders and it's always like that, that you tell somebody the one line and they actually don't even understand what you're talking about. Um, so it is 100% it is worth refining that one liner because you are basically using it probably 20 to 50 times a day. So spend the time to get it right. An example here, Airbnb, um, book rooms with locals rather than hotels. Very simple back then, marketplaces weren't even things, they couldn't even use the term, but they explained it in very simple terms. Because the marketing deck, those 10 slides are really one test of are you a captivating storyteller? Um, and the whole point of it is because captivating storytellers, if you can get people excited about what you do, you will be able to get the best employees on board. Those employees will be able to pull in the best customers on board. And again, by storytelling those um, with lots of customers, you'll be able to fundraise much easier. Fundraising is never um, the, the end goal of any journey. It should never be your goal in the first place. It should always be happy customers. So yeah, 
captivating storytelling is really important and that one liner is just a really basic um, tool to get that right. Right, we've got the first slide. What are the three most important slides of your deck? And just a little mention here, those are not necessarily in the order you should be using them and because each one of you obviously has their own storyline. So just like mix and match all those slides based on what story you're actually telling. Um, the ambition slide. The ambition slide is um, usually a mission or vision statement and it ideally also captures what you do. It is really important that, um, that there is kind of like a, what we call a life's mission, which you work on. Something bigger that you actually want to change in the world, some bigger problem which you're describing, which just needs fixing. And the best founders who you've met are the ones where they recognize there's this massive, massive problem in the world. But right now they're gonna tackle this niche and then they can explain in, vi in visual terms and beautifully how they're gonna actually reach that larger vision. An example here is bringing healthier and more affordable food to everyone everywhere. That is an insane mission. It is absolutely massive and, and worth pursuing. Mixed panel helped the world learn from its data. Absolutely massive and they're starting with um, online analytics and then they can expand step by step. Slide number two, again, like this is not necessarily in the order, is the team slide. You absolutely need a team slide um, and make the team slide awesome. Um, and when I say awesome is every single one of you has great experience of why you're doing this startup, great motivation, some great background, and, but never undersell yourself. Always just remember that you're trying to get somebody's 30 minutes. So you just need to make, um, um, make them want to meet you. Common mistakes in here are adding up the years of experience. Um, so that just doesn't really mean anything. I've been 10 years in Microsoft is way less relevant than I've led a team of 50 marketeers kind of thing. Forgetting the logos, um, absolutely put the logos in there. As, a, as I mentioned, you only have 20 words, but you can put lots of pictures in your pitch deck. And the selling yourself, we already mentioned, so never undersell yourself. If you need the treatment, go to America, meet a bunch of Americans and just hear how they talk about startups and founders. And it's, it's very interesting. Um, I'm not saying you should be just like them. What I'm saying is just like, just actually listen to the way they talk. It's, it's quite interesting. Going cute, what do I mean by that? Um, is just make titles very clear. Like sometimes we see in pitch decks, chief happiness officer. And here you always just question like, what does that actually mean? Um, so just make it very clear of CEO, CPOs, um, CEO, whatever it is, um, and make it very clear. Including in adjectives, not numbers. I think I mentioned that like three or four times in a, in a 20 minute presentation, but it is really important. Just like genuine numbers are just so much more relevant than any adjectives you can be using in here. Um, LinkedIn URLs, really easy way to, to hack the kind of 20 words per slide where you won't be able to show your entire CV or in, the, in the 10 slides, but you can actually include a LinkedIn URL for people to look at it. Too many people on the team slide, um, I would stick to kind of one to five people max. Too many advisors on the team slide. Just remember, co-founders are the most important uh, people in your startup, especially at the early stages. Um, so just really focus on the co-founders rather than on the advisors. Just a really quick example here. Um, so here, there are some goods and bads. You've got lots of um, logos, great. CEO, CTO, and co-founder, co-founder, not that good. Ideally, we would know the position. 10 years in Microsoft, not that good, but then again, directed 50 plus engineers. And um, so that's kind of super interesting. Again, like acquired first 100,000 Twilio customers, awesome experience, numbers, tangible, etc. So just a couple of like goods and bads on that slide. I'm just gonna go a little bit faster. There we go. So we're on to slide three, traction slide. And um, tractions is all about numbers. Numbers, numbers, numbers. Um, and small numbers are better than no numbers. That's the other thing to remember. Even if you're just at the very beginning of the stages, like actually explain to people how far into the journey you are. You have sent out the survey to a thousand people. You had 500 responses. Out of those 500 responses, 200 of them said, the, hell yes, I'm going to pay for this. Out of those 500, um, sorry, out of the 200, 100 want to pay 10 bucks, in a, um, 10 bucks a month. The other one want to pay five bucks a month. Perfect, great, validation, and everybody knows you at that stage. That's perfectly fine. 
Because good numbers, good news comes in numbers and bad news comes in words. Overall, um, if we see a traction slide with no numbers at all, it's just basically the assumption of it, like you actually haven't done any validation yet. Traction slide is always do dollars of users. So um, dollars of users means ideally users is customers and dollars ideally means revenue. And um, obviously that varies across um, startups and your revenue and business model. A couple of examples here is 20% daily growth on signups. Um, so this was Coinbase very early on in the day and they just show like this very early kind of journey of signing up customers. Again, here, very early days, but then they chose the metric of 65,000 US dollars transacted in the first five weeks. Like you're onto something, it's still super early, but it's perfectly fine. I'm just gonna skip that. Two slides you almost certainly need, which you probably already have in there, is a clear declaration of your customer's problem and your solution. And the problem always should come first. And the problem is actually the more important part of it as well. Um, so really clearly articulate that. Um, again, a solution, um, a, a slide in here, an example is um, Airbnb. So the price, um, the problem is price hotels and no easy way exists, which is super interesting because you already, your eye already leads you there. But then you can actually really clearly just um, distill down the, pro um, the problem itself. On the solution side, again, here it's a web platform. Again, like back then it wasn't, marketplace wasn't even a thing. And you can see already like you save money, you make money and you share culture. That's kind of like the solution and it directly relates to the problem which we were just talking about. And then the one line I've got in here is where users can rent out the space to host travelers, which is also very interesting. All right, we have five slides down and we've got six slides which you can consider adding. And that kind of just depends on, on your business and how far along the journey you are. And the first one is a clear articulation of your business model if it's not blatantly obvious. Sometimes you don't even need that. Um, often um, it, you still wanna clarify how much are you charging? What tiers do you have? Just make it very simple. Often people have a mix of software, hardware and different types of business models. Just choose one, which is the one you wanna go with in the future and just don't overcomplicate it. And you can always explain all the intricacies of that in your 30 minute conversation um, after somebody has read your pitch deck. Here, the business model is um, we take a 10% commission on each transaction. Super simple um, and very easily explained. Market slide, quantify the size of your first customer segment you're targeting and the size of your total available market. So that kind of just depends. Here's an example again, this is an egg ingredient startup. It is a $6 billion opportunity for egg ingredients themselves. But then if they want to expand into all other core cool products like mayo, scrambled eggs and cookie dough, it is a $55 billion market, right? So you just kind of want to go into what are you, who are you initially serving and what is the bigger vision? Unit economics, or at least an approximation of them, um, ideally keep, um, I would always recommend it for startups who have been at least around for 12 months. So you have um, data to analyze but you can approximate it. So that's kind of the customer acquisition and um, repeat customers and lifetime value, um, which you can put in there. A why you slide, if there is a particular reason and um, why the team slide, if the team slide isn't um, enough for you, you can definitely put in a why you slide of like, why are you the best person in the whole world to solve that problem? Because potentially you've got some patents, you've got, um, you are the only person who's ever worked in that kind of company and industry before, and it's worth actually explaining that further. The why now slide. Um, so this is kind of really interesting, especially um, with the economy shifting and changing. Why is now the best time in history to invest in a business like you? And it's really interesting to give that some thought um, of why that might be the case. And the very last slide is definitely, definitely include an ask slide. Um, just say how much money are you raising and where it will get you because you're sending the pitch to somebody because you want something from them. So just actually include it in the, on the last slide. Like what is, what are you looking for? And we're in 23 minutes. Um, I'm just going to cover another two minutes of slides and then you can ask me any questions. I know I've been talking very fast. So there's probably not even that many questions yet. Um, because you're all concentrating. <laughs> so slides to consider ditching is as you meant, as you saw the competition slide is actually something I didn't, <clears throat> didn't mention in here because um, I, again, like you only have 10 slides and you can always cover all the negatives or like all the things which take away from your business, which are kind of like the competition um, in the conversation afterwards. 
um, unless there's a blatantly obvious like incumbent in the market. So if you are a, a um, internet search engine, you might want to cover why you're better than Google. In most other cases, you actually don't even need a computation slide. Testimonial slides, um, well, you can take them out as well. They're always positive. Um, we've never seen a pitch deck which has negative customer reviews. Um, so therefore, they actually don't really mean that much. Financial projection slide, as you uh, also saw, I actually skipped that one. It, um, I would exclude it out of the 10 slides because they always look exactly the same. If I look at 100 pitch decks and I've got financial projection slides in there, every single slide of those 100 startups will look exactly the same because they always end up at $100 million in revenue in five years' time. Oh, geez, that's already it. <laughs> wow, okay, I did cut this deck down. <laughs> Let's power into the Q&A. So Struan asks, what materials do VCs want to see at the warm intro stage? Is it best practice to also send marketing plans, revenue models at the intro stage? Um, at an intro stage, I would, I would literally just keep it super simple with one pitch deck. Because at the intro stage, what you want to do is hit somebody up, um, a friend of yours who can introduce you to a VC. And ideally, they just always forward this one document, which is your pitch deck. So it could be super simple to those 10 slides. Again, like here it's always just about people just want to you want to raise enough interest for them to meet you you don't want to explain the entire business in one go awesome Jillian asks what slides demos video content do you see as critical to a successful pitch um just, sorry but just one um, once again oh what slides demos videos um content do you see as critical for successful pitch um yeah so with slides um um, for, for me, it's always the problem and the team slide. So they're absolutely crucial. Um, so number one, are you actually solving a massive problem? And two is, are you the right team in the world to solve it? And what is your connection to a problem? That's the most important thing. Um, in terms of video, there's probably nothing in really in there. In terms of demo, again, like not in those 10 slides. Um, screenshot of the product, perfectly fine. And that's actually kind of interesting. Um, I would not... Well, you can actually put a video link in there because people often watch that as well. I wouldn't actually see that's a cr crucial part of the pitch though. Cool. Sean asks, what about non-VC investors? Should we think differently about angels and other sophisticated investors? And maybe I'll also ask, um, add like strategic partner investors as well, who actually understands the business a little bit more than a general VC investor. Yeah, totally. And that's a really good question where again, like this was very targeted at VCs, what I just mentioned. Um, and you will have angel investors, etc. And what you want to do is always just consider the audience and how much or how little knowledge they have. I would almost start with the basic deck, which I've just presented to you, but then you do want to fine tune it based on the audience. So the ask slide will change. Your technical explanation will change. If you're already talking to somebody who knows um, your industry inside out, what you might want to do is dive into a lot more depth, for example, on the solution itself. So yeah, you definitely um, want to adapt that based on the audience. Cool. Um, I'll move on to some of my questions. What's the best pitch you've seen at Start Mo Startmate Demo Day and what's made it the best? Oh, wow. Um, Startmate Demo Day, I mean, that's a slightly different types of pitching um, to a pitch deck itself, but it's um, the best one you can watch is probably if you Google um, Startmate Demo Day and um, Muso, Muso app or Marketplace for Musicians. And there was um, in our Sydney 19 cohort um, now a year and a half ago. Um, those guys did an absolutely incredible job in pitching itself. And that was a matter of number one traction. They really highlighted as part of um, the deck how fast they've been growing in even just six weeks. And the second part of it is an absolutely incredible delivery of presentation style itself. And um, so just again, listen to Jeremiah and the pitch. He's a real estate salesman. So it definitely helps. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Can you give an example of a strong and well thought out ask at the end of a pitch deck? Yeah, um, well, um, a couple of um, tips here on the ask side, which is one, you wanna always mention like how much money are you raising so people know the size of the run. The second thing you don't wanna do is actually um, say at what price you're raising because you always will set yourself a ceiling. So you don't wanna say I'm raising a million dollars at $4 million because nobody will give you a higher valuation than that or it's hard to get above the ceiling. What you want to do is just say, um, what do you think my business should be valued as? And you actually get a couple of data points before you set the valuation. A strong ask is one where you can then very, um, where you can say, what are you going to achieve with that money? If I'm going to raise a million dollars, 
not only who am I going to hire and what I'm going to spend money on, is but what will it unlock me in the business to do? We call it unit of progress, but like, what is that unit of progress? What is that next stage of your business that you can take that business to? And that's really interesting. We've got a lot of um, pretty niche questions. Do you want to answer them in the last minute? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. How does um, uh, how does pre-revenue B2B uh, model calculate the um, cost of um, acquisition? Yeah, you really can't uh, unless you take approximations online um, because you just don't have the data yet. And at that stage, I wouldn't even say that's actually that important yet. What advice if you're, if you're an early stage company looking for seed money with one to two people? With one to two people, my advice is really just have one person focus on the fundraising, the other person 100% focus on the business. And you're only pulling that person whenever they need them. You don't want to be wasting both people's time just on fundraising. That would be my advice there. Should you pay out the percentage of stock with a payment plus fee for attracting investment from an intermediary? This adds up and seems to be common. Um, wow, all right. I've, been, I've hardly ever seen this and I would not recommend it. The job of fundraising is always the job of the CEO and the founder and um, because they are the most integral part of the business itself. Um, Will a link to this recording be um, <laughs> we given? Yes, you can slow it on my talking as well. <laughs> and um, from Bill, how many time generally do investors spend on each slide? And um, in your opinion, which is the more in two slides? Yeah, so the main two slides, I would say, are the problem and the um, team slide. And how often, how much time do they spend on it? Honestly, the, um, I would just skim through that in 20 to 30 seconds. And so what is it, three seconds per slide kind of thing? And you kind of get the general idea of what's going on in the business. And then the last question is, you talk about captivating storytelling and related to music's story. Do these personal attributes carry an unfair weight? Well, yeah, they do, um, which is kind of what, for example, Melanie Perkins does at Canva. She just just able to capt captivate people in her huge mission and, vi uh, mission and vision. And this is why she's got a um, billion dollar company now with hundreds of employees because she can actually get people excited about what she does. And it is an unfair advantage, but it is, it is such an awesome advantage to have. <laughs> awesome. We are now past half past. Thanks so much, Michael, for an awesome pitch coaching session. We now know the importance of pitching and storytelling. So next week, we're going to take it a level deeper and learn about how we can craft our story. And as Michael mentioned, as a founder, you'll be repeating your story over and over again, whether it's to investors, potential hires, PR customers. So storytelling is a magnet to get the right people on board. So make sure you join us next week for Storytelling with Kate Dynan, who's the founder and CEO of Character, who will be interviewed by our wonderful head of community, Danny Pinkers. Thanks so much for joining this Tuesday and we'll see you next time. Thanks so much. Right. See ya. Bye.